Heavenly Father, we come here before you, and we understand that we are weak. Lord, we don't have um, the best mind. We don't have the best voice. We don't have the best um, thinking. But Lord, we ask that you would give us all those things. And we understand that if we don't come before you every single day and stand before you, that we'll never receive it. We ask that you would be here with us today, that you would open up our hearts, that you'd give us a heart of passion for you to serve and to worship you, to fellowship with you every single day. Let the words that will be spoken and the songs that will be sung, let all of those help to open up our hearts and to give us a better understanding of you and what you intend for our lives. Bless Pete when he's going to be preaching. Bless the band when we're going to be worshiping. And bless all of us that we'd stand before you, holy and in awe of our wonderful God. Amen.
lost our saved, found their way at the sound of your great name. All can then feel no shame at the sound of your great Perfect, perfect, perfect. Uh, folks, we're going to be going back. That was on purpose. We're, we're going we're gonna to go back into Acts uh, chapter 2 today, actually. We're going to cover, I know we were, we're trying to move forward through the book of Acts. Should I move the microphone up just a little bit? Yep. Let's try this. There we go. I'm not sure how this thing works, but this looks about right. Is this good? There we go. Test, test. All right. Uh, perfect. So I know we're going through the book of Acts. We're trying to move forward. Um, but today we're actually going to take a quick step back uh, to look at Acts chapter 2 again. 
uh, which we covered just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but uh, we're really going to kind of take a harder look at one of uh, the three, uh, one, of the, one of the pieces of the Trinity or one of the individuals of the Trinity and how the Holy Spirit acts within the church. So if you guys do have your Bibles, please open them up uh, to Acts chapter 2. If you don't have your Bibles, you have your phones. Obviously, you have the Bible app. Go ahead and open it up because uh, we're going to really get in there. Hopefully, you guys can mark it up. And we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit today. Now, I love to begin with an illustration because it's always so applicable. And, and this time, uh, uh, there's a story from the Sunday school class that was, you know, a traditional, I believe it was maybe a Catholic uh, Sunday school class. And they recited the apostolic creed before they would begin, sc- begin their you know, service or their class. And what they would do is they would kind of go around and ask each of the kids to say a line from the creed. And they had it memorized. So the first girl stands up and says, hey, I believe in God, the Father, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And then the next kid stands up and says, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. And then there is dead silence. And finally, uh, the, the, the first girl says, oh, the little boy that believes in the Holy Spirit is not here today. And... I think that's so applicable to our church or to a, our, some of our traditional churches because we so readily talk about God the Father, right? If I say, we believe in God the Father, we're all going to say, amen. And then, hey, we believe that Jesus came down and died for us, we're going to say, amen. And then sometimes if I say, you know, we believe the Holy Spirit's going to do some great things amongst us, you're going to say, get out of here, we're Baptist. You know, we don't, you know, the Holy Spirit, we, we don't want to deal too much with that. It's too charismatic. And I think sometimes we see that dichotomy where some traditional churches are afraid to talk about the Holy Spirit, and then charismatic churches kind of take it to places where it doesn't need to go. And we see two extremes where, in fact, we should, um, we should take a harder look at what the Holy Spirit really is. Rabbi Zacharias has a phrase that I've got it written out for myself, and he says, when man is bored with God, even heaven does not have a better alternative. When man is bored with God, even heaven does not have a better alternative. And that's kind of the reason we're going to look at the Holy Spirit. We can't get bored with it or we're going to start to attribute some things to it that it shouldn't be doing, that it, that is not part of the Holy Spirit. And then uh, we also don't want to ignore it and get bored with it because we're not paying any any attention to the Holy Spirit. And folks, the Holy Spirit has so much to offer us today and so much that it's doing today. So I really want to spend the next 45 minutes to just deep dive into what the Holy Spirit uh, uh, does in terms of his work today. But in order to talk about today, we're going to actually go back. And so the first part of my message today, we're going to begin with the promise. Before Acts 2, before the Holy Spirit came down in the Pentecost, there was John 14, 16. So before Acts 2, before we jump into that, there's a preface, uh, a preface of the promise. And I'm going to read from John chapter 14, verse 16. And this is the words of Jesus to his disciples when he says the following words. He says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. So Jesus saying, I will ask the Father to give you another help you, helper to be with you forever. Verses like this, if you've got John 14, 16 open, I like to mark with a little triangle on the margins of my Bible because um, this is a verse that involves all three members of the Trinity. You've got Jesus speaking about the Father sending down the Spirit. God the Son, God the Father, God the Spirit. He says, I will send down another like me, another helper, What does that tell us? Well, let's go through Holy Spirit 101, right? Um, Have you guys ever heard of the phrase, like father, like son? Raise of hands. Who has? Okay. All right. Perfect. Who here is uh, married and has some kids, maybe? Okay. Perfect. We've got some. So would you say that is true? Maybe wives? Do you see, look at your husbands and think, oh, look at him. They're playing with Legos together, right? Sometimes it's like son, like father, where the father immolates the son. There's a story about a young, uh, a young um, f- 
father that brought his kid, his son, into the emergency room. The kid had taken one of those Lego toy wheels and stuck him up his nose. So they took it out, you know. <laughs> they leave. 25 minutes later, the father is back and asks to speak to the doctor and says, listen, I was driving home, and I was looking at this little toy wheel, and I was thinking, how the heck did he get it up his nose? And then he leans his head back, and sure enough, <laughs> the little wheel is up his nose now, too. So we, we see fathers, uh, sons emulating fathers, fathers emulating sons all the time. A lot of great sons had great parents, had great fathers, had great mothers behind them. Uh, General Douglas MacArthur, who uh, led a lot of the, um, uh, led a whole theater of war during World War II, had a decorated father who was a Civil War vet, right? And we see great fathers bringing up great sons, great parents bringing up great sons that are like them, that are similar to them. Now, we see the same thing here when he says, I will send you another helper. He says, I will go to my father, and there will be, I am the son, I am similar to my father, but hey, there's a third piece of the Trinity, and it is just like me and like my father. We are all the same. There is God the Father, there is Jesus, sorry, there is God the Father, God Jesus, and God Holy Spirit. John 14, 7, if you had known me, he says, you would have known my Father also. Listen, if you know me, you know the Father. If you know me, Jesus says, you would also know, we can extrapolate from this, the Holy Spirit. You would understand who the Holy Spirit is, and if you know the Holy Spirit, you know the Father as well. So we are all God. So let's, let's put a couple of basics down about the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit 101, first of all, he is an individual being. The Holy Spirit is an individual being. You see this when you look at the baptism of Jesus, when you saw Jesus in the water, you saw God saying, uh, hey, this is my son, uh, and then you saw the Holy Spirit coming down, descending upon Jesus as he would begin his ministry. So what this tells us, folks, sometimes we like to imagine like the Holy Spirit like Casper, like some ghost, right? Like some vaporous thing, right, floating around. Um, let's forget that. The Holy Spirit has a mind. It's an individual. We maybe don't understand everything about it, but it's a being. It's an individual being. The second part of that is that the Holy Spirit is God. So it's an individual, but it's also part of the triune God. Again, God the Father created the world. He was walking there in the garden with Adam and Eve. God the Jesus, he came to this world to die for our sins, right? Resurrected, came back to God the Father. And then God, Holy Spirit, comes down to be with us now until the second coming of Jesus. I think we're all on the same page. Now, some of you, if you're here and you're an unbeliever or if you're new to the faith, you're like, what? Hashtag mind blown. You guys believe in three gods? No, we don't believe in three gods. We believe in one God in three manifestations. We, we could say just as we humans have the body, soul, and mind, uh, body, soul, and spirit, rather. We believe that God also has these three different facets of his being. No, I can't explain it to you. Uh, we as humans don't quite understand that relationship, but we believe in one God in three different manifestations, one of which is the Holy Spirit. None is greater than the others. None is less than the others. And the final point about the Holy Spirit is that it does live inside of us. The Holy Spirit does live inside of us. Folks, can you imagine God, right? I know movies are a time killer. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not saying go out and watch these movies, but recently there's a couple that came out about space and space travel that were just incredible because they really tried to stick to the facts and really tried to kind of draw that picture of space uh, accurately. And you go and watch one of those. I remember, you know, we watched one with Anna, and I'm, I'm remarking to Anna, and I'm saying, listen, this, uh, it, I'm walking away, and I'm thinking, wow, is, not, is God not great? 
like all of the space, all of these stars that he created and, and the, the laws of physics that govern all that, isn't God amazing? And Anna obviously had fallen asleep by that time, right? So, uh, no. But you go outside and look at the stars and, and you think all that space, everything that's out there, isn't God incredible? And then we come to the fact that he resides within you. He resides within you. So you think about God the Father. You think about God Jesus. I mean, here's this, the other part of that, you know. The disciples are walking with Jesus. They could feel him. They could touch him, right? So they're with him for three and a half years. And Jesus is doing all these miracles. He's healing people. Uh, he's breaking the bread and distributing. And there's plenty. And he's walking on water. And, and, and you're thinking, this guy's incredible. And the sermons he's saying, it's like nothing we've ever heard before. So you've got God the Father, you've got God Jesus, and then we come to this realization that God, who is just like these two other beings, the Holy Spirit, the third part of that trinity, he lives inside of us. So you think you're walking with Jesus and think, man, it's so cool to be with Jesus, and then all of a sudden Jesus is within you. God lives inside of you. Part of the same God that created the world, part of the same God that did all those miracles, said all those sermons, died for your sins, he now lives inside of you. And that's incredible. Sometimes we, I mean, maybe that scares us a little bit because we like to be with Jesus, right? We like Jesus to be with us because it's, it's awesome. You know, he, he'll feed you. He'll tell you awesome sermons. Um, he'll walk on water, calm the storm. And we like Jesus for the stuff he does. But when he resides inside of you, it's a whole different aspect because he begins to change you. You become, you become abnormal. You, you become weird in the eyes of your friends, right? And we say, Jesus, I don't know if I'm ready for that step for you to live inside of me. I want you, I want you as a friend. I like your gifts. I just don't like the giver that much, right? And that is, by definition, idol worship. And so, Jesus, God, the Father, God, and the Holy Spirit, God, each with its own function. But importantly today, folks, God, the Holy Spirit, lives inside people. God, the Holy Spirit, God lives inside people. That's incredible news. Now, we jump into Acts chapter 2 because we know God the Holy Spirit, we know his facets, he's an individual, he's God, he lives inside of us. Let's see when, when the Holy Spirit came. Let's kind of jump into chapter two. I'm gonna read uh, just the first couple of uh, verses here and then we'll break them down. Acts chapter two, let's read them together. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, being the disciples of Jesus, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. God, the Holy Spirit, comes down and fills them, right? And begin to speak in other tongues, languages, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, and at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. We're going to pause right here, actually, uh, as we kind of break down this coming of the Spirit, right? The first time it comes down to earth and begins to reside in men. Now, that being said, it had come down previously to, to fill people for certain tasks, but now it was here to stay. And in this moment, I mean, you can imagine... Nine days, ten days passed since Jesus ascended. The people have gathered together. I mean, if you can imagine like a community group or a Bible study group, they've come together, they're waiting for the, hey, we're gonna pray, we're gonna, you know, let's remember some of the things that Jesus said. Because they didn't have the book of Acts, they didn't have anything but the Torah, right? So they're saying, they're, let's come together, Let, let's reminisce and let's talk about Jesus. Like, what do we do now? Who's, he, we, he promised to send us a helper, but he gave us a mission. What are we going to do? They're coming together, waiting for prayer, and all of a sudden, stuff begins to happen. Stuff begins to happen. Now, one note of caution here. 
you're going to see a lot of like and as if. Because sometimes when God moves, we can't really describe it in human words, right? We have to compare it. Has anybody of you like in, been in a major earthquake, a major earthquake, right? Maybe a 5.0 or above, a couple of folks, right? Uh, ironically, the, the biggest earthquake I've ever been at has not even been in California. It was actually in Virginia. And we're sitting having some food uh, at, a, at a place, at a restaurant, and I just feel like there's a train. All of a sudden, everything begins to shake. And it's as if a train is going through the parking lot. It, I mean, just that sound uh, of just the earth vibrating, that's the sound it makes, as if literally a train is going through the parking lot, right? I don't have any other words to describe the sound, as if it, there was a train. Um, and so when we read about all of this here, the, in fact, Hermann Olhausen says the whole description, he was a German theologian, he says the whole description is so picturesque and striking that it could only come from an eyewitness. So what we're reading here is an, almost an eyewitness account. When, when uh, Luke wrote this, he came to Peter, actually, a lot of his material comes from Peter, and he says, listen, tell me how it was. And Peter says, listen, we're sitting there, we're having community group, we're waiting for some folks to arrive, somebody's running late, somebody's bringing the pizza, you know, we're, we're just sitting there, and all of a sudden, stuff begins to happen. And the first thing that happens, there's three signs, he says, the first was, there was a noise. I, Luke, I don't know how else to put it, man, it was, it was as if there was a wind rushing down, not an actual wind sound, but as if a wind, this, this, this noise as something coming down. And then the second sign, there was, uh, there was this light that looked like tongues of fire. I don't know how else to describe it. And it comes down, and in this, uh, j just if we look at the Greek for a second, tongues, it uses the word glossi, which means tongue as in the literal tongue or as in language. And it's actually going to be a pun on words later on, but he says these tongues of fire descend down and then they begin to separate out and rest on people. And when it says rest on people, I don't know if it was on their head or on their backs. Maybe it kind of enveloped them. Maybe they looked like they were just surrounded by this. I don't know. But, uh, but all of this light that looked like fire was in this room. And then all of a sudden, the third sign, finally they begin to start to speak Different languages. Again, the Greek word glossi. So these tongues, these brought languages, and we begin to speak different languages. And you could understand, right? So somebody was saying, you know, in Italian, fratello. I looked that up. That means brother. Or in Spanish, hermano. Or in Californian, bro. <laughs> right? Russian, brat, privet. Babushka, you know, you could understand each other. These were languages. It wasn't gibberish. And he says, I, I, I promise you, Luke, this is how it happened. We were there and it happened to us. And write it down. This is how it was. This was when the Spirit came down to stay. This was, this was it. These were the signs. And so we look at this passage and we say, This is incredible. So, how does that happen? Today, how does that happen today? Like, if I come out and, and I receive the Spirit, will that happen to me? Like, will, will all of a sudden people look at me like, oh my goodness, the guy's on fire, and, and I'll be speaking, you know, Spanish all of a sudden. My high school Spanish would, would come back to me. And we say, well, let's, let's back, back up a little bit, and let's understand exactly how the Spirit works today. And I'm not saying it works differently, but I'm also saying um, that let's understand the reason behind it. All the little bits and pieces. The spirit today is not contained to a location, so you don't have to go back to where those men were in that same community group. The spirit is everywhere today. We understand that. It's not, you're not only going to get the spirit on a certain holiday. You're not only going to get it on the Pentecost, Right? That one day a year where you can get the Holy Spirit, right? That's not accurate. We can get it at any time. We understand it's not um, only if for a certain calling, like the pastors have the Holy Spirit and nobody else does. Um, that's not accurate. It's for every single individual believer. We understand that that's how the Spirit works today. And so, folks, 
the, the last part of the message, that'll take up a little bit of time here, we're going to look at five ways that the Spirit works today in our lives. But I want this part of the message to be as a challenge to you. You have the bulletins. By all means, take notes. Write these down. And I want you to examine yourself right now. This is going to be a test. I want you to just maybe check off and see, does this apply to me? Do I really have the Holy Spirit? Sometimes we like to look at ourselves. I mean, we, we all think we're great people. We all, oh man, I'm a great believer. But the disciples didn't try to define the Spirit by what they were doing. They, they didn't have acts to say, well, I, I could probably do some of these things. They said, listen, whatever the Holy Spirit does in me, that, that's the Holy Spirit. And today we can look at that and say, all right, what is the Holy Spirit doing in us, and do I have that Spirit? So, folks, just challenge yourself. Let the Spirit test you. Don't test the Spirit right now. Let the Spirit test you and see if you have the Holy Spirit and if it's doing its supernatural work in you. And one more note is, as we go through these five signs of his work, right, as what kind of work the Spirit is doing today, you will notice it's all supernatural stuff. It's unusual stuff. And any one of these you can use today as a proof for God's existence because we're talking about God living amongst us. I mean, this is a tough message to preach because when I'm preparing for this, I'm thinking literally, what are the signs? What evidence do I have that God lives amongst us? And this was it. So we have five examples of his supernatural work today. And so the first one is the work of the Spirit. The work of the Spirit is to give boldness in preaching and in witnessing. To give boldness in preaching and in witnessing. A survey was given to those attending one of Billy Graham's seminars, and they asked the question, what is the greatest hindrance to witnessing? Folks, I think you can relate to this. 9% said they were too busy to remember to do it. 28% felt the lack of real information to share. None said they didn't really care. Everybody said, I, I care about witnessing. 12% said their own lives were not speaking as they should, but by far the largest group was the ones that said 51% uh, were those that said whose biggest problem was the fear of how other people would react. 51% said, I'm afraid of how other people would react. Folks, witnessing to people is not a normal thing, right? Right? Coming up to a stranger and telling them about your passion, your beliefs, it's not a normal thing. You don't do that with, some, with other things in your life. You don't come up to a coworker or, or just a stranger on the street and say, bro, you've got to listen to me. I've got to share with you about this incredible experience I had at Taco Bell. <laughs> Their Crunchwrap Supreme is on sale for 99 cents. You don't just begin to spout things and they look at you and they say, you're weird or you're getting paid by Taco Bell. We understand that just doesn't happen, right? You don't go telling people about your passions, random strangers, that's weird. That's not natural. But yet, believers go out and are passionate in sharing with strangers, with people around them, anybody, about their belief that there is a God, that Jesus Christ came and died for their sins. Where does that come from? Where does that boldness and that desire and passion come from to go out and speak to people and witness? It's not normal, folks. It's supernatural. And boldness, folks, when we're talking about boldness, we're talking about to the death. There's a story I really, really love. I may have shared it uh, before, but, but I want to bring it up again just as an example of this. It's about a Maasai warrior, which is a tribe in Africa, uh, named Joseph. Uh, Joseph, this, and this is a true story, Joseph actually uh, told the story at a uh, Billy Graham crusade. Um, it's his, it's his life story of how he came to God. He said, I was walking down the side of the road, um, met a missionary that was kind of walking in the same direction, and over the course of an hour as we walked and talked, 
And Joseph accepted Jesus Christ as his personal savior. Praise God, right? Amen? So Joseph accepts Jesus Christ as his savior, and in that moment, we understand that he accepted the Holy Spirit. God began to live in him. And the Holy Spirit begins to do supernatural work inside Joseph and gave him this boldness to witness. And combined with his love for the people that he grew up with, Joseph returns back to his village and says, guys, you will not believe this. And he gathers the Messiah elders together and says, I, I just learned that we have been worshiping the wrong gods. There are not numerous gods. There is one God. And to Joseph's dismay, the elders didn't take that very well. They shunned him, they beat him, and they kicked him out uh, unconscious. They, they threw him out of the village. Joseph awoke. It was hot. He was losing blood. He managed to get himself to some water, recover a little bit, and as he was recovering, he thought, man, I must have not presented it. Maybe I didn't choose my words well enough. I've got to rethink this message. So he recovers and, and goes right back to the village, and this time he gathers everybody and says, guys, um, I, I, maybe I misspoke last time. You guys didn't understand me. There is only one God, and you're not worshiping him, and guess what? There's heaven and hell, and after we die, you're, you're going to go to either one, but guess what? Jesus Christ came down, and he died for you, and he didn't get a chance to finish until they all beat him, unconscious again, broken bones, threw him out of the village. They thought he was dead, but fortunately he wasn't. Again, he wakes up. Again, he manages to recover, find some water. And again, he's saying, what did I say wrong? So he rethinks his message. He recovers and then decides, I'm going to do it one more time. So he goes back to that village. He says, guys, even if it kills me, I love you guys so much. I need to tell you that there's somebody that loves you. It's the one true God, and he sent his son to die for you. And again, they attack him. And in fact, they have the women take barbed wire and beat him because that was the most disgraceful thing they could think of. But this time as they were beating him, Joseph could see that they were crying. And when he awoke the next time, he was actually back in his hut being taken care of by the same people that were ordered to beat him. And he finds out that as he went unconscious, the people said, no, I, this must be the truth. He keeps coming back. And folks in that village were saved, according to his testimony. Guys, that's not natural. You don't do that for your other hobbies and beliefs and passions. That is just evidence of God moving in people. That is evidence of God living amongst his children. And so that's how this, the number one way that the Spirit acts today amongst the people of God. And that's the number one question on the test of, do I have the Spirit? The number two way and the number two example of his supernatural work today amongst Christians is uh, his conviction of the world of sin. So his purpose is to convict the world of sin. To convict the world of sin. We're going to read this in John chapter 16, verse 8. Jesus is talking about the Spirit, and he says, And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. When he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. If you're an unbeliever today, you look at this verse and you say, oh my goodness, this verse is so judgmental. It's, it's so judging and it's talking about righteousness and, and sin. It feels so heavy. I don't like this verse. Folks, this verse and this role of the spirit of conviction may be the most merciful thing that the spirit does in the lives of the world and in the lives of believers. It may be the most merciful thing that the spirit does because, let me put it this way, the spirit works inside of us, right? So it's not outwardly going out to judging it. Inwardly judges people to the sin. And some will believe, some will harden their hearts. And so, Here's the point. 
what happens when that convincing, that convicting voice inside of your head, inside of your heart, however you want to put it, that tells you what's right and wrong, what happens when that voice goes silent? Or maybe there's somebody here who hasn't heard that voice in a while. You know, that inner intuition as to what's right and what's wrong. What happens when sin begins to look normal to us? When that voice goes away, this is what happens, folks. I'm reading from, uh, this is taken right out of the Detroit Free Press, June 29, 2015, just a couple of months ago. A woman is on trial, and I'm just going to read right from the, from the press clipping here. Michelle Blair pleaded guilty to murder today in the deaths of two of her children, 13-year-old Stoney Blair and 9-year-old Stephen Berry, whose bodies were discovered in a deep freezer at the family's home in March. Quote, Michelle, I don't feel no remorse for the death of them demons, she said. During the hearing in Wayne County Circuit Court, Blair, 36 years old, recounted details of the abuse her kids faced prior to their deaths. She admitted she punched Stoney, put a bag over her head until she lost consciousness, threw scalding water on her, hit her on the head over and over and kicked her. Quote, Michelle, I definitely meant to kill her. If I had a chance to do it again, I would. Does that not make your blood run cold? And you think, here truly is a person that has lost any conviction for what's right and what's wrong. Now, most of us here say, well, I'm not that bad. I'm not that bad. I, I kind of understand what's good and evil. Folks, that's where it all begins, when that voice stops speaking within us and little sins begin to look all right. And then the bigger sins begin to look all right. I would quote a preacher and say, if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit of God that's in this world, that's restraining the evil of humankind, then we would all be mini Hitlers. That's the only thing keeping us from being like a Michelle Blair. I know we like to argue today. I actually have a friend who's an atheist, and, and we have these discussions, and his argument sometimes, hey, we're good people. We can be moral, right? Well, let's go down that path of questioning. And if we really get into it, why should I be moral? There is no reason. It's all about survival. There really is no reason for humanity to be moral other than just to look out for myself for my own well-being. If I feel like it, why can't I kill somebody? If it suits me. They're in my way. They're now out of my way. I can do whatever I want. Folks, the Holy Spirit the convicting voice of the Holy Spirit today in the heart of humanity is the only thing that's keeping this world from sin, anarchy, and complete destruction. And so that is the second role and the second way we understand that the Holy Spirit moves amongst people today. The third way and his third role is to provide spiritual gifts, to provide spiritual gifts. So we're going to read here from 1 Corinthians Chapter 12, verse 4 and on. 1 Corinthians, chapter 12, verse 4 and on. Apostle Paul writes to the Corinthians, to the church, he says, Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers all them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to the, another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. 
to another working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues slash languages, to another the interpretation of tongues slash languages, right? All these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. As he wills. There's a lot of argument today between various churches and doctrines um, and belief systems about whether God still performs miracles today amongst the church. Whether God still gives certain miracles to the church. I believe it, that he still does. And I know we ask the question today and say, Pete, well, why can't I walk on water then? Why can't I heal the sick? Or God, just give me a little miracle, right? Just a little miracle. Like, if my lawn could just mow itself, just, that's all I need. If I don't have to mow the parents' lawn, just a little miracle, I'll be, that's all the Holy Spirit needs to do. Or we say, well, why can't I have tongues? Why can't I speak all of a sudden after repentance, speak 20 languages? That, that would be awesome. I could pass all my college courses faster and I could speak to people easier, right? I could connect with folks more. It seems like a good thing, right? So we said, listen, if this applies, why didn't it apply to me? God, some people say, show me a miracle right now and then I'll believe in you. If your Holy Spirit still does miracles, right? Why doesn't God just do a miracle right now in front of the whole world and they'll all believe, right? So let's kind of break this down First of all, I do believe that the Holy Spirit still does work through miracles today. They still, it still does work through miracles today. And here's where I base it off of, folks. When you have missionaries that come out here in front of the church, I'm talking about people that gave up everything and said, I'm going to give my life to serving Christ. Just devoted people, they move to these countries where a lot of times they're dealing with just complete violence, their life is in danger, they're dealing with shamans and just demonic powers, and they come back and they kind of share some of these stories and they said, listen, I've seen God move and do incredible things. I've seen God do these miracles, and we think, that's incredible, I want that too. But, but I don't want to leave my gated community I don't want to leave my armchair and my TV. I've got everything pre-programmed perfectly. But I want God to do those miracles in my life. I don't think that's how the Holy Spirit works today, folks. I think you would agree with me. God still performs miracles. And he performs them for his mission and for his calling. And he performs them through ordinary people that are extraordinarily Hopefully I pronounce all that. That's a lot of letters. Extraordinarily devoted to him. I'll give you just an example. Uh, my father is a uh, pastor on the East Coast. And he was just recently sharing this with me. It's not like he's some healer or, you know, the second coming. I mean, just an ordinary pastor in a rural country church. And he said, this couple came to me. And um, They've been married for years and years, and they've been praying and trying for a kid for five, six years. The doctor said, there's no way. Uh, finally, you're not going to have a child. It's not meant to be. And so finally they said, you know what? We're going to put it in the hands of the Lord now. And they come to, uh, to my dad and say, Pastor Peter, if you could please just pray over us. Um, if God will do a miracle, you know, then it is his will and to his glory. My dad prayed. And he said, I didn't think anything over. Oh, we gave it into the hands of God. He says, nine months later, I'm in the hospital doing a visit with somebody who's sick. And I meet this guy walking through the hospital parking lot with flowers. And I'm like, what are you doing here? He said, well, I'm here because my wife just gave birth. Praise God. Amen. Amen. God still does miracles today, folks, to those who are devoted and for his will and for his glory. God still does miracles through the Holy Spirit. And for, secondly, I believe the Holy Spirit still works through gifts today. Not only miracles, I still believe he gives gifts today. We read in this passage in Corinthians, he says, hey, it's going to be of my choosing. There's going to be various gifts, and I'm going to decide, and it's going to be for the common good. It's not going to be just for you. 
It's going to be for the common good. So, folks, if you're going to stand up today and, and begin to speak funny languages and, and just make weird noises, it's not for the common good, right? I mean, we can maybe get a news camera in here and get you know, people interested in our English services, right? And maybe, maybe that's the common good. That's about it, right? It's not for the common good. He says, what your gift is, what your calling is, it's going to serve the kingdom. And he gives to each. Maybe you're sitting here and thinking, well, I don't have a gift. I don't have a calling. Well, then it's one of the two. Either you don't have the Holy Spirit or you haven't made any effort to apply the calling and the gift that the Lord has given you, right? Because each member of the body, he goes on in, Second, in 1 Corinthians chapter, um, uh, ch chapter 12, he goes on and later on he talks about each member of the body has a function. All of them have something to do and it's all various, we read. It's not all the same. They're all different. You have d various functions and gifts. Somebody's going to preach. Somebody's going to be great at hospitality. Somebody's going to have languages. That's right. And I, I know Brother Peter here, I I'll call you out, man. Uh, we were in Mexico working with kids. A and what, what you were able to do as a translator helped our work out immensely. What Brother Paul does right now, even as we're speaking, and he's interpreting everything into Russian, I mean, it's, it serves everybody who's listening, who's online. He says, that's going to happen. That's fine. That's natural. We're, I'm going to do that in the church. But everybody's going to have their own function. And there's so many gifts. And it's going to all serve the kingdom. And so that is the third way that the Spirit works today. He says, you're going to be able to, in prophecy, you're going to be able to speak new things. You're going to look at Scripture, and I'm going to inspire you. That happens today. And I'm going to do miracles today. So that's an evidence of God's work today. Fi uh, not finally, fourth. fourth. The fourth way that the Spirit works today amongst people is that it bears fruit of the Spirit. It bears fruit of the Spirit. We're going to read Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Galatians 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace and patience, kindness and goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such things there is no law. Some of us think, uh, you know, if I just named some of those off and I said love and peace and gentleness, you'll think, well, I'm already all of those things. I'm such a loving person. I'm the gentlest man you know. Well, that may be so in your own eyes, but let me put a more extreme example before you. What would it take to change a felon into a preacher? A man with a violent history into somebody that now is out there giving himself up for Jesus. A pastor was telling a story. He says one time they called him into court to do a character witness on, on a man um, who had a previous uh, background of incarceration. He had been to jail before. And they, you know, the judge calls him up onto the stand and he says, listen, we, we have to ask you a question. You're a pastor, you're a respected member in the community. Can a man who's been to jail be a good person, be a good father? Can somebody like that be trusted? And the pastor says, well, yes and no. There have been many great men that have been in jail, like Apostle Paul. Needless to say, he was never invited back to that church again, to the court again, rather. Human logic dictates that, hey, you're a felon. We're going to brand you. You're an abuser. You're a drunkard. You're lazy. We're going to brand you, and we're going to kick you out. You're useless to society. Human logic says, you made a mistake. You screwed up. We don't need you anymore. We want only good people. If you're somebody who's a destructive force, you're useless, and you're useless forever. Get out of here. We have nothing to do with you. God said, no, I can change that. God, through the Holy Spirit, does supernatural work today that people can't do. 
Folks, you tell me what five-step plan or 10 days to perfection, what book are you going to put in front of me today that's going to help somebody who's a habitual liar become somebody who can speak the truth? Somebody who is just an adulterer, is never faithful to his wife and left the kid. How is that man going to come back to his family? What book, article, logic, conversation are you going to have to change that man? What is impossible for man is possible for God. God does supernatural things amongst people today. I've told this before, and I'll repeat myself. I loved it. I walked into a church in Russia once when we were on a missions trip with a youth group. And standing at the doorway, the pastor was like, let me tell you about some of these people, you know. And I'm looking out, and it's not like the kids in the front, you know, the, the choir and everybody. I mean, we're, I'm talking about like, it looked like the mafia was there. <laughs> these guys were just tatted up, just looking like thugs with Bibles in their hands and big smiles on their faces. He said, listen, that guy right there, he served 10 years for murdering somebody. That woman killed her husband. That guy robbed a bank. That, and he's just pointing these people out. He says, and now they're all rehabbing and they're all here and they're all part of this church. Is that not a sign of God's spirit doing supernatural things today amongst people on earth? Amen? And he does the same today. I know we like to think we're good people, folks, but if you're honest with yourself, if you look at yourself in the mirror, just one-on-one, -on -one, you and God, you know what's going on inside your life. You know your weaknesses. You know what's happening there, the battles that you struggle with on a daily basis. God knows them too. Many of you will share testimonies of battles fought, of where you are now, and only by the grace and the power of the Holy Spirit have you won those battles. Many of you are still going through those battles, but the only way you have victory is through the Holy Spirit. And so that is his fourth um, work amongst people today. And finally, the fifth work, his fifth task amongst people today is to give assurance of salvation. To give assurance of salvation, we'll read Romans verse, chapter 8, verse 16. Romans chapter 8, verse 16, Apostle Paul writes, The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit. God, the Spirit testifies within us that we are the children of God. That is the, fourth, the fifth task of the Spirit today in this world. I know we've all kind of faced these questions before. Be honest with yourself, right? Eternity is no joke. Heaven and hell is, is not something we take lightly. We understand this is real stuff we're talking about. This is real stuff we're talking about. And so I know all of us here have at some point thought to ourselves, maybe as you're going to sleep at night, you know, when your mind kind of goes blank and things start to come up, or maybe you're sitting in church convicted by the word and you're thinking, am I really saved? Like, honestly, like, how do you know that you are saved? How can you prove to me today that you for sure, if you die right now, you're going to heaven? Honestly, how do you know? Like, is it a 50-50 chance? Is it like 80-20? Like, I, I'm posit pretty sure I'm going to? I mean, I would think if somebody was pointing a revolver at me and saying, you let me know when you want me to pull the trigger, which, which uh, chamber the bullet's in, I would want to know where the bullet was 100%. I don't want even a 0.5% chance of getting shot, right? And so we think, listen, eternity is forever. Eternity is forever. How do I really, I mean, this is no joke, folks. How do I know that I have the Holy Spirit and that I'm saved? Well, that's the function of the Holy Spirit. You know, I don't think God ever had, in, in his plan, he's like, listen, I'm gonna keep these guys in suspense my children on earth, they're going to be dying to know, literally. Like, you're going to die, and then you're going to find out, you know? Oh, uh, you, you lived a good life, but guess what? You, you didn't make it. Uh, that's not the, the plan God had for us. His spirit will testify to us. Well, how does it testify, Pete? Because I don't have 
crazy languages. I didn't have the fire of the Holy Spirit ascend on me. How do I know today that I'm saved? How do I know today that I have the Holy Spirit? Well, folks, we just went through four other bullet points of the Holy Spirit's work today in us. And so let's, let's look at those. I mean, look at yourself and say, do I have the boldness in preaching and in witness? Do I desire that? Am I passionate about this? Or am I constantly overcome by fear? If I do, well, I think that's a good chance that I've got a Holy Spirit. But let's look at the next one. Does the Spirit convict me of sin? Do I have that inner intuition that tells me this is wrong and I run from it versus running to it? If I know the scripture says and hints that this is not correct, that God hates this, do I run from it or do I desire it more? Because that's the work of the Holy Spirit in us. To provide spiritual gifts. Do I know what my calling is in church, in my family, in society? And do I apply my gift in using and in, in, in building up the kingdom of God? Folks, I'm, uh, honestly, I, you know, I, I was thinking about this, and I think, you know, we all come here, and we love sitting on the benches, and we, you know, hey, preacher, feed me, you know? And, and the pastors are doing 80% of the work in church sometimes, it looks like, right? And I think, man, we've got so many folks that are sitting here that have the Holy Spirit, that have these gifts, that have this calling, and they don't apply themselves. But if everybody applied themselves, how much greater would the kingdom be in West Sacramento? To bear fruit of the Spirit. So that's the next item on the test, right? Am I bearing fruit of the Spirit? Am I a better person today because of God than I was yesterday? Or is my anger issues getting worse? Is my laziness, is my greed, is my pride worse today than it was last year? Are my relationships on a decline? Or are they ascending because God is slowly changing me into his image? And finally... To give assurance of salvation, do I have that peace? After testing everything, can I, in peace, walk out of here today and say, I've passed the test? Some of you guys know uh, Pastor Paul Washer, a missionary. Um, not to be confused with Paul Walker, the race car driver slash actor. Uh, but Paul Washer, um, great, great preacher. This kind of gets things down to just, hey, it's between you and God, Right? Uh, where are you at? And I was listening to a recording of his message years and years ago. And he said, hey, after my message, I would like my wife to come up and give her testimony. I said, this is great. I want to listen to this. And she comes up and says, folks, I, I really have to be honest with you. I was raised in a Christian family. I became a missionary at a young age. I married Brother Paul here. And I just accepted Jesus Christ as my personal savior couple of weeks ago. She said, I was sitting at one of Paul's sermons and all of a sudden it hit me that God gives us all of these tests in scriptures. He gives us all of these tests. It says, examine yourself, examine yourself, examine yourself. I want you to be sure. And all of a sudden she said, I sat there and I realized I finally applied the test to me and I realized I didn't pass the test. And now I'm here pastor's wife, a missionary's wife, 12 years into this marriage to say, you know what? I didn't know God all this time as I should have. Man, I had goosebumps. I mean, when do you see a pastor's wife come up? When do you see a pastor, a preacher, somebody, a deacon come up and say, guys, I've got to be honest with you. I think, I think my life doesn't pass the test. And sometimes we're afraid but I'm a Sunday school teacher, but I'm, I'm, I'm a minister already. I'm, I'm working in the green. I'm doing stuff. People know me. Uh, they think I'm a Christian. Folks, do you pass the test? I'm going to leave you guys before we stand in prayer. I'm going to leave this quote with you from C.S. Lewis. What can you ever really know of other people's souls? Of their temptations, their opportunities, their struggles. What do you know about other people? One soul in the whole creation you do know. And that is the only one whose fate is placed in your hands. If there is a God, 
you are, in a sense, alone with him. are going to come out and they're going to we're going to have the free will offering right now i just want to remind that this is for the our church members and you'll feel that in the response time um, it's a natural response uh, to give back so uh, as our ushers come out we're going to continue with uh, our one last song Amen. Mm-hmm. 
Someday to my home. 